Hi, Sarah. Salut, Frank. <laughs> Salut, Sarah. Because <laughs> uh, you speak French, actually, right? I do, but I'm my not as well as you speak English. So okay, but you That's can like have a, have a conversation in French, I guess. Like, oui, or... je peux m'exprimer en français. Oh, okay. Je comprends okay. aussi, mais. Okay. Well, that's good to know because we are actually going to meet face to face in Brussels in what is like Tuesday on, on Sunday for the Festival de Liberté, where we're going to talk about your book and um, I'll I'll join the conversation when we start to move to towards the the Palestine question and um, and that's what I wanted to talk. And by the way, I mean the the video is not live, so but um, for people who are watching this and who are in Brussels. Uh, the conversation with Sarah is taking place at the Théâtre National at 8 p.m. on Sunday. Um, so I, 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 you know, enjoy, you, you should join us. I, I think it's going to be a very special moment. Um, so, I, I, in a way, I'm doing these interviews and stuff because I'm very interested in, in, um, in people's journey, mm -hmm. you know, in life towards truth, towards knowledge, towards the other, towards the unknown. And anyway, because I've been involved uh, with the, I don't know what to call it, the Palestine question for, for so long, uh, people's journey into understanding what's happening there, in a way, interests me even more. And um, so maybe I'd like to start by asking you about, you know, some kind of a background story of, of your story with Palestine. How did it evolve? Well, so I was born in New York in 1958. And I come from an Eastern European Jewish family. And I was raised with this idea that everybody hates the Jews and the Jews are the most oppressed people on earth. And at one period, that was true. Um, my family emotionally did not, I, I really believe they did not understand what happened in Palestine. I think they saw Arabs as yet another historical force against the Jews. They did not comprehend that Jews now in the state of Israel had state power and that this was the first time in Jewish history that this had been true and that this was a transformation. So like for example, in 1967 war, when I was nine, my parents woke us up in the middle of the night. This is in New York City and they said, there's a war in Israel. Like they were panicked that this was going to be a repeat of a massacre and all of this kind of thing. So that's how I was raised um, with this defensive, distorted view of the state of Israel. Uh, and I had a lot of refugee relatives from Eastern Europe who ended up in Israel, many because they could not get visas to the United States, right? So there's this, from the beginning, there was this identification with Israel because our relatives lived there. And this was the reason that if you have family members in Israel, you should support the Israeli state. And that's a very hard thing to grapple with. So I think that for many years, I simply did not grapple with or face the reality of Palestine because I think there was so much that I would have to undo about what I've been taught, my relationship to my family, what family is supposed to do, and all of this, that um, something I'm embarrassed and ashamed of now, but until not until a very late date did I start to even think about it. And the reason that that all changed was not an interior revelation on my part. It was from the exterior world that intervened in my life. So I had written a book on homophobia in the family and I was invited to Tel Aviv, to Tel Aviv University, to a conference on gay and lesbian studies. And I, this was in 2009. I wanted to go because I came from a very homophobic Jewish family, and I thought that that would be an appropriate place. But a colleague of mine at the university where I taught in New York City, who was a Turkish Jew, said, you can't go. There's a boycott. And I said, what boycott? And she said, well, you should find out. So I thought, okay, I'll find out. So I wrote to two people, Naomi Klein and Judith Butler. And I asked them about it. And Naomi Klein never answered me. But Judith Butler answered me within two hours. 
And she sent me all of these links and all of this information. And um, she sent me information on an organization called Boycott from Within. And this was Israeli professors, Jewish professors who were supporting the boycott, which I then discovered had come into being in 2005. I had never heard of it before. So, and I can see now that my very first investigations were that I asked Jews. I didn't think to ask Palestinians or Arabs or anybody. Um, I, I approached it as a, as a Jewish issue, and that shows you how closed-minded I was and how much I had completely internalized the frame that I had inherited. So I read everything that Judith sent me, and I realized that I couldn't go, that I would be crossing a picket line. And I had been raised in a pro-labor family, and you don't cross a picket line, and that this was a boycott. And that the boycott was dependent on people like me, that the people, Palestinians asked for the boycott, but internationals had to do the boycott. So I wrote a public letter to this gay and lesbian studies conference saying that I couldn't come because of the boycott. And then I received a, an email from Omar Barghouti in Ramallah. And he was like, oh, Professor Shulman, Thank you so much for taking this principled stance. And I thought, oh no, what if he's homophobic? Because there was a history in the United States of people supporting the Cuban revolution, not realizing that gay people were being put in concentration camps in Cuba. And I had no idea what the situation was for queer people in Palestine. Of course, I knew there were queer people there, there are everywhere. But I thought, oh no, what am I doing? So um, through some solidarity people, uh, I got a message saying, come to Israel on your own dime, pay for your own ticket, speak at anti-occupation spaces that are not boycottable and come to Palestine and meet with Omar. So, um, and they said, Naomi Klein has just done this and it was very beneficial. So not really knowing anything and not understanding anything, I just decided to go with it. And I, I knew that I was going to make a mistake at every turn, but I just felt like I had to do it. So I went. And the first place I spoke was an anarchist vegan cafe in Tel Aviv that was supported BDS. And then I spoke at the Women's Center in Haifa. And there were people there from Aswat, which was the is the Palestinian queer women's organization. And I, that was the first time I met queer Palestinians. So it was arranged that I would go to Ramallah and I would meet with al Kaus, who was the queer Palestinian group. And then the next day I would meet with Omar. So I was taken by a group of Jewish anarchists to um, Berlin, this village where there was a protest every Friday, a Palestinian village. And I go, I know, and it's like, everything is new. These are ideas I've never heard. These are people I've never heard of. And I'm a very well-informed person. So it's a complete media blackout in the United States at that point. So, it's a small Palestinian village. People are marching around saying, you know, the wall is between us and our olive trees. And we're marching around. And suddenly the Israeli soldiers come. And I look at them and they look exactly like me. Because if my family had not had a visa to come to the United States, that would have been me. And in America, Jews are usually not soldiers, right? Jews become like teachers and dentists and accountants and things like that. So I'm looking at these people who look exactly like me. And then they're sending, they start shooting gas, tear gas. And we're not doing anything. And the people, Palestinian people, take out these onions out of their pockets and smell them so that this gas, which makes you think that you're suffocating, doesn't them. And all of a sudden, it was like my head spun around. 
And all of a sudden, my sense of we and who I identified with were, were not these Jews, but were these Palestinian people. And my whole world changed. And that was the beginning. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and, and that's what I think your story, in a way, and, and, and the story of, uh, of many uh, people of Jewish descent is crucial because you, you touch on a point that is if you really want to know what's happening in Palestine uh, nowadays anyway you can find everything right there's no way um, a sane person um, who wants to read and 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 understand what's happening on the ground cannot do it but then you, you touch on a very important point and I uh, I read an interview of, of yours when you you talk about the fact that because it would turn your world inside out you it's it's cognitive you know cognitive dissonance right you you'd rather not touch this topic because in a way deep down you know the truth but the truth will be such a shock to everything you know and you've built in your family and your relationship that you'd rather avoid it i i recently watched a film called tantura I don't know if you've seen this film. It's about, I, I think he's doing the festivals now. It was at Sundance. Uh, it's about the, the massacre of, of Tantura in uh, actually on my birthday on the 23rd of May, 1948. I mean, I wasn't born in 48, but I'm born on the 23rd of May. And you have all these really old former Haganah uh, soldiers, uh, women and men who talk. And it's quite touching as well. They're very old. Uh, they sit on a table together. And at one point, one of them starts to say, yeah, of course, we, we, we did kill people after the fighting ended. You know, we, and you've got this woman who says like, Moshe, Moshe, like, like we don't talk about this. And one of them says, yes, it's a lot easier to forget, to continue your life. And, um, and maybe I want you to, to, to talk about this a little bit more. Um, because, I mean, he works for, obviously, Israel Palestine uh, when you're, either from Jewish descent or you've been taught, you know, taught that Israel was this like beacon of hope in the Middle East, but it works on many issues, obviously. But um, maybe I want you to talk about this, this like you'd rather close your eyes because the, the truth we shocking in a way. Well, it's interesting. I mean, there's two. So the U.S. government is funding the occupation and it's the U.S. government, my tax money that provides military aid to Israel and allows for all of these atrocities. And there's two different forces in the United States that support this. One are Jews who are still pro-Israel and the other are right-wing Christian Zionists. Now Jews are a small minority in the United States. It's like 3%. Right-wing Christian Zionists, these are the people who are behind Trump and all of this kind of stuff. There's a, they're growing and growing. But as more and more Jews speak up against Zionism and against the occupation and for Palestinian liberation, there's this clash within Judaism, within the Jewish community. And the other side is going to these insane strategies now because they're so desperate, right? So the big thing that they're doing right now is that they're trying to create an official definition of anti-Semitism so that being critical of Zionism makes you anti-Semitic. And organizations like New York, like City University of New York, I mean, huge public organizations with a lot of credibility are adopting this bogus, strange, fantastical definition. And so, you know, I, I would say my biggest confrontation with this was in my university in New York, I was the faculty advisor to students for justice in Palestine at my school. And we had quite a few Palestinian students because um, one third of the school was Muslim. And I was charged with anti-Semitism by the city university. And I had to get a lawyer and go to a hearing and this was like the most bizarre thing that ever happened to me. I mean, I'm as, you know, look at me. I'm as Jewish as they come. I have two Jewish names, Sarah and Shulman. I mean, I speak Yiddish. It's like, and here I am charged with anti-Semitism. 
The university hired the lawyer who defended Dominique Strauss-Kahn when he raped that African woman. That's who they hired. And I had to go in there and they had 14 pages of charges against me and everything fell apart. Of course, I was completely exonerated, but it's because they're trying to force a false idea that being for justice and being for fairness is anti-Semitic. And this is how desperate they are because they have nothing, they have nothing to justify their position. The level of atrocity is so overt, the kinds of murders, the kinds of violence. I mean, it's one thing when the word apartheid was introduced. And once you go there, you see it's apartheid. I mean, there's no doubt, but people had trouble with that as a concept. But you see people being murdered. You see people being bullied. You see children being arrested. You see it every day. So what are they defending? You know, they're they're defending something that doesn't exist. That's a very important question, right? Like, what are they, what are they defending? And and actually talking about the because uh, you talk about the IHRA uh, definition, um, Kenneth Stern, Kenneth Stern, yeah, the author wrote this um, this article, right, in the Guardian in two thousand and nineteen. And the the title of the the article was "I drafted the definition of anti-Semitism. Right-wing Jews are weapon, weaponizing it." And that's that's the issue um, because this, you know, equating criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism is also very very dangerous, isn't it? What do you what do you think? Everything about, about it. It's 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 a complete falsity. And also we're in a time where fascism is on the rise all over the world. Of course, there's also Jewish fascism, which is racist against Arabs. But you know, white supremacist fascism is anti-Semitic in the United States. And um these people are they're so insane with their supremacy ideology that they're making it impossible for themselves to even go forward. Because they're they're clinging to an idea that Jews are superior. This is really their belief. I mean, I have talked to many, many, many Zionists, many who I'm related to, you know, many for many, many years. And what it really comes down to is there's a there's a feeling that Jews are special, Jews are better, and other people are not as important. And when I ask, like, how can you justify? having a country where people have rights that are different based on their religion. How can you justify that? They will elevate their, their description of who Jews are and denigrate non-Jews. That is what they're, where they're coming from. So it's a very delusional, but it's also very much in tune with the global trend towards supremacy ideology. And, and also, in a way, equating criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism means for people that don't have time to think too much, equating all Jews with Israel, in a way, right? Jew and that's very dangerous because it could then, you know, anti-Semitic acts act all over the world could happen because like, hey, you a Jew, you're pro-Israel because, you know, they're they, they making this this equation and i think this is uh very that's very true traumatic. but that's yeah. less it's less of a crisis than the hypothetical of where it could go is less important than where it is right yeah, now of course. which is yeah. this brutality against palestinians and um i also wanted to talk to you because you you talk a lot about the lessons of the that people should take from the jewish genocide also known as the Holocaust or the Shoah. Uh, can you talk to, to, to me about this? You know. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I went to, when I was young, I went to Yad Vashem, and it was in an early, which is the memorial to the Holocaust in Israel, and it was in an early incarnation, so it was a little more chaotic. And, and then when Jim Hubbard and I, my collaborator, went to show a film about the AIDS activist movement in Palestine, we, we brought it to Palestine, our film. And we went back to visit Yad Vashem and it was like 30 years later and it was very tightly controlled. And you're going through and it gives you this brilliant, you know, very well-researched 
history of how fascism and anti-Semitism came into be. And then suddenly the conclusion is Zionism. And you're like, no, wait a minute. The conclusion is no nationalism. The conclusion is no racism. The conclusion, the lesson of the Holocaust is no supremacy ideology. And they make this leap that isn't even logical. You know, um, so that's, you know, and it's also within Israel. I mean, it's, it's a very, the, when you get into this whole thing, it's so fascinating, right? Because half of the Jews in Israel are of Arab descent. And prior to the founding of the Israeli state, the Arab world was a world of Muslims, Christians, Jews, and Druze. And Jews were an integrated part of the Arab world. When, when Arab Jews came to Israel through both being rejected and also being attracted, there's a, there's a dynamic there. People were told to give up their Arab, Arab identities. They stopped speaking Arabic. They changed their names, right? Um, and there's this whole psychological separation from the Arab world. But if Arab Jews saw themselves as part of the Arab world, then Israel-Palestine would be a majority Arab country with European Jews as a minority. So there's even there, there's a lie and there's a twist um, that where people are understanding themselves in ways that are very distorted and imposed. So there's just so many, so, so much smoke and mirrors and so much distorted thinking. And that level of insanity itself is not sustainable. You know, um, what it does to a society, uh, we're seeing it in the United States right now, how crazy everyone is being made by the supremacy thinking and all of these punitive laws that are coming down on people and, and in, you know, insane non-logical approaches that are all about control. And, and that's what you get when you're constantly lying and positioning yourself as better than another person. And also what's important to understand, and, and you, you really mention this often, is that when you talk about the Palestinians, you're talking about the whole of the Palestinian community. So for you, Palestinian means you know 11.6 million of people in occupied Palestine, including Gaza, in the camps in Lebanon, but also in the diaspora, because in a way they are victims of what happened to their grandparents or their great-grandparents in, in 48. And that's also crucial to understand the apartheid analogy um, that actually it's actually a, a, a smaller group of people um, having power over a larger, much larger group of, of, of Palestinians. Uh, I wanted to talk to you as well, because it's important to as activists to to look for change and path to, you know, social justice. Um, first, you talk a lot in your book about social media and uh, to say that uh, for many years, the only sort of, we had actually that Norman Filkenstein wrote a book called uh, Images and Realities about the, the Palestine issue. Images, what you see in the mainstream media, what you've been fed to, uh, but reality is often very different. And um, you mentioned that the Gaza war of um, 2014 was a radical change in this regard. Can you, can you develop a little bit? Well, it was, um, there was, so it's a mass murder of civilians by aerial bombing. Uh, and yet it was positioned as though Israel, this highly militarized state, was somehow threatened by the people who they were decimating. And this is the trick of the whole, um, the paradigm of the perpetrator describing themselves as the victim. And we see this everywhere in, in the world right now because we're in a right wing swing. So white people are telling you that they are the victims when you're in a dominant position and you, you're raised to think that you're better. Anybody making you think about yourself, you describe them as though they're hurting you, they're abusing you, they're attacking you, they're threatening you. But all they're doing is illuminating who you really are. 
and and this is this is so present in how Israel describes itself in relationship to Palestine. So how do we how do we create change? Because you also talk about this um, that change is actually made by a, a small group of people most of the time. You don't need a majority to create change. There was actually, and I, I looked into this, uh, a study um, at uh, UPenn who said that the tipping point for large social change was about 25%. Mm. So, we, you know, which means that, and they've studied that from, from 25, let's say from a group, a group of 10 people, uh, if you have 25% of this group that agree on one idea and, and put it towards the other people, it can switch uh, the ideas of, uh, and the concept for these people very quickly. So, and, and you talk about this also in regards to the, uh, uh, the AIDS movement that you, you were very much a, a part of. So, um, yeah, how, but how do we reach this 25%? How, how do we do this or start doing this? I mean, I think the tipping point is the question that we're all grappling with right now, because we're seeing that globally, Every year, there's more and more support for Palestine. On the ground, people support Palestinian liberation. That is clear. You see it in students. You know, Students for Justice in Palestine is the largest political student organization in the entire American university system. Uh, we see, uh, you know, queer people are for Palestine. People of color are for Palestine. And younger people support Palestine, but we don't see the tipping point. We don't see it impacting on the ground. And it's because the minority that is supporting Zionism is controls the finances, the U.S. government. Joe Biden is very pro-Israel and he's pro-military support for Israel, even though there's more and more and more opposition to it. We now have a Palestine caucus in the U.S. Congress. Who thought we would ever have that? You know, so it's it's a mainstream topic, but the old guard has not let go. And that that is the obstacle. So do you think the youth could be the answer? Because, you know, again, Norman Fulkinson wrote this book showing that young American Jews are less and less, you know, even interested by Israel. Uh, so even supporting. That's true. You know, supporting but it's Israel. not only Jews. It's, this is something that's in the hands of everybody. You know, Jews are a small minority. The, our, the, the biggest supporters are the right-wing Christians um, for religious apocalyptic reasons. And look at how much power they have in the United States. They've just taken away abortion rights. I mean, they're so powerful. It's amazing. But um, nobody knows what the path is that is going to change the paradigm. But building grassroots is all we can do. And as as it, as Palestine becomes more and more of a mainstream topic, that will build the grassroots. Um, unless there's a sudden event that changes everything, and that can also happen. But you know, the zeitgeist is out of our hands, unfortunately. Thanks, Sarah. Um, very much uh, looking forward anyway continuing this conversation face to face uh, on sunday because i think it's um yeah it's a, it's a crucial it's a crucial one to understand obviously palestine but i think palestine can be a window into understanding in a way what's wrong what's very very wrong about the world we're living in but also what can be very very beautiful you know with the solidarity movement and stuff about the same world so um Hopefully, the beautiful will will win against the, <laughs> right. the horrible. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. Okay, see you on Sunday. Yes, bye-bye. Okay.